Anyway, we're going to talk about oxygen sensors and their importance in rebreathing. Uh, but before I go on to that, I, I just want to uh, give credit to the people that participated in this. Uh, this whole PowerPoint had its genesis in a conversation I had with Bobby Franklin. Uh, we spoke about linear deviation and how most rebreather divers were not really fully aware of, of how sensors operate and how uh, important they are as far as staying safe while you're diving a rebreather. So anyway, he had a little paper that he did, and he sent it to me. I looked at it, and I said, yeah, this is pretty good. Do you mind if I build on it? And he said, by all means, do whatever you want with it. So with that, I began this PowerPoint, and I put the PowerPoint together, and then I said, wait a minute, Joe. You're a diver, but you're not really an electronics guy. So I said, let me see if I can find other people that have an expertise that is better than mine. So I sent it to Marty Watson, who's an electrical guy. Boy. And and I oh. sent it and I sent it to Joseph St. Amon, who is a uh, Actually, he's a PhD in electrical engineering or electronics engineering. So this is his forte. And then when all was said and done, I sent it back to Bobby Franklin, and we all put our heads together and came up with this. So this is a collaborative effort on, on everyone's part, and I think that that's an important thing in any any endeavor. You, you need to know where to find the accurate information. So anyway, with that, let's get started. Uh, the oxygen sensors uh, and their importance, okay? It's, it's critical that you know what gas is in your loop. Uh, you need to know what you're breathing. So oxygen sensors are simultaneously the most important and yet they're the most fallible components in a CCR. Uh, a thorough understanding of oxygen cell fundamentals is essential if you're going to dive or rebreather. Um, if you go back in time, if you remember one of the biggest objections to rebreathers was the whole concept of electricity and water aren't typically compatible. So oxygen sensors and their chemistry simply stated an oxygen sensor is a galvanic cell that emits a current or the rate of flow of an electrical charge in a linear fashion. It has a cathode and a lead anode connected by a resistor immersed in an electrolyte. Oxygen is reduced to hydroxyl ions at the cathode. The ions diffuse through the electrolyte and oxidize the lead anode, which generates the current. So this is very similar to a battery. Uh, it's also the same process that you would use when you uh, do electroplating or anything else. It's all similar. So oxygen sensor operation. Gas diffuses into the sensor through a Teflon-like solid polymer membrane. A hydrophobic membrane, one which allows gas but not water to pass through it, is added to keep the sensor clear of condensation. Gas must pass through these membranes to reach the electrolyte. This controls the response time of the sensor. Sensor response time must match the rebreather controller program. So, basically, you've got two membranes in there. One which is critical to the operation of the uh, sensor itself, and the other one is critical to keeping moisture out of it because we go back to our statement before about water and electricity not being compatible. Um, then you have to have a sensor that has the correct response time for your rebreather. So why must the sensor response time match the controller? Because if it doesn't, it's going to possibly fire prematurely and overshoot the set point. 
Okay, typically uh, the sensors, most of the rebreathers that I use have a, a six second response time. So what that means is that if that sensor takes longer than six seconds to reach like 90 or 95 percent of, of its value, it's going to tell the solenoid to fire again. And we don't want that because then you're going to have too much oxygen in your loop. Oxygen sensor circuitry. Sensor electrochemical reaction is sensitive to temperature. Circuitry within the sensor compensates for temperature using a thermistor device. Circuitry allows the CCR to measure sensor output as a voltage. So basically, your sensor is going to be sensitive to chemicals, uh, not chemicals, excuse me. It's going to be sensitive to moisture and it's going to be sensitive to temperature. Sensor fundamentals, okay, so sensor integrity impacts our ability to manage a CR. Sensor output characteristics vary from sensor to sensor. You're never going to get three sensors giving you the same readings. Okay, there's always going to be some variation between them. Sensor characteristics change as the cell ages. Again, go back to the battery analogy. Sensors don't always fail gracefully. Sometimes they just fade away, and other times they just spontaneously fail. Sensors can fail at any time. The age of the sensor does not necessarily indicate its health. So you can have a brand new sensor out of the out of the bag and just have it arbitrarily fail. I've had that happen. I've had brand new sensors fail right out of the box. So two key skills for staying alive on a CCR is tracking your sensor performance throughout the cell lifetime and detecting sensor failures and reacting appropriately, appropriately to them. So sensors can fail in a counterintuitive way. One, one would expect their output to diminish, as would a battery, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes outputs can spike. Sometimes they calibrate fine and then become unstable mid-dive. Then they'll stabilize on the surface, so you're scratching your head saying, what's going on? You need to be aware that that cell is probably bad. One way to affirm this is to switch the position in the sensor carriage, i.e. put number two in the number one position or whichever cell is giving you the problem. If the problem follows the sensor, you know it's bad. If the problem stays in that position, you know you probably have a, a problem in your rebreather head. So anyway, sensor so anyway, carriage. These these characteristics are typical. Okay, so out of the box, you're going to usually get between 8 and 12 millivolts in the air at sea level. Now, that's going to change with altitude, obviously. Uh, the range is 0 to 100% oxygen. Understand that anything beyond 1.0, your sensor is reading pressure. Uh, maximum output. This doesn't really apply to what we do. They have 175 millivolts. Uh, realize that these sensors are used in, in medicine, and rebreather use is a very, very tiny output, uh, a tiny uh, uh, percentage of the total sensor production. Most of them are used in hospitals and uh, operating rooms and whatnot. Uh, your response time is usually six seconds or less to get you to 90% of the actual PO2. So the sensor will read 90% of your true PO2 uh, within six seconds. The final value may take 30 seconds or more. 
Relative humidity is zero to 99%, non-condensing. So that means the sensor can function in wet environments if the sensor membrane is free of condensation. So what does that mean? If the sensor membrane has condensation on it, it's going to skew the readings because the surface area is now diminished. You've got droplets of water covering that, that hydrophobic membrane. So the, the diffusion across that membrane is going to be slower. All right, operating in storage, temperature is 0 to 40 degrees uh, Celsius. Operating temperature range, 0 to 40 again. Uh, sensor life, 36 months in air. Okay. 36 months in air is not 36 months in the rebreather. The life of your sensor is reduced with extended exposure to high PO2. Why? Because the high oxygen content burns the fuel in the cell quicker than 0.21 that you have in ambient air. Linearity, plus or minus 2% of the final value. So that means you already have plus or minus 2% uh, error built into the, into the sensor. So linearity. Sensor linearity is crucial to our safety. Uh, sensor integrity impacts our ability to manage the CCR. Linearity can be tracked in many different ways. Linearity can be used to predict future performance. So I assume everyone knows what, what linearity is. And if you plotted this, your, your sensor output on a graph, it should come out pretty close to a straight line. Individual sensors read slightly different in air. 63 millivolts can translate to a PO2 between 0.94 and 1.47, possible operating region. Sensor calibration enables us to accurately determine PO2 for the millivolt output of that particular sensor or the calibrated operating region. So if you look at this graph, okay, the amber colored cone is your possible operating region. The straight dotted black line, is, the straight dotted black line is the linear line from calibrating and the dot is the calibration point. So when you calibrate it at that little black dot and you get that straight line, that's a perfectly linear cell, which does not exist. So green is your calibrated operating region. So what we're saying is that the further away from the calibration point you get, the greater the deviation from linear is going to be. Okay, so when you calibrate your sensors, you want to do it in similar conditions to that you're diving in. So what that really means is that if you're in your hotel room and you've got the air conditioner on so that it's putting frost on the walls, that's not really the ideal place to calibrate. So you want to, if you know you're going out to sea, wait until you're out to sea and the rebreather is as close as you can get it to the conditions you're going to be diving in. So obviously, if you're in a 15-story building with freezing air conditioning, you don't want to be calibrating there when you, if you have the opportunity to do it out on a boat. Sensor linearity can be checked. Okay, You can check it with air and then do the math and predict what it's going to give you in pure O2. So you can flood you can flood your loop with pure O2 and look at the millivolts. And then when you get in the water, you can verify it again at 1.6 uh, with pure oxygen. So you, you can do a, a, an oxygen flush at 20 feet. And hopefully you're going to get reasonable numbers. So oxygen is often used for calibration. It is 
as it is closer to your typical operating PO2 of 0.7 to 1.3. A more accurate method to calibrate would be after the absorbing canister has reached operating temperature and humidity. You're going to get that by pre-bleeding. That's an ideal situation, but it's kind of impractical. Uh, I don't recommend pre-breathing and then uh, calibrating again. It, it should, it, you know, you should do it in a stable environment and not at a, you know, at a dive site if you can avoid it. So correct calibration is critical. Incorrect calibration will give you an incorrect PO2 output on your controller. Verifying the PO2 in relation to the millivolt output helps ensure calibration was done correctly. Most controllers calibrate at one atmosphere with 100% O2. Some controllers have two-point calibration, or they may calibrate in air. Uh, and I dive calibrates in air, and then what I do is I cross-reference it with O2. So it's critical that you know and understand how your controller calibrates. A good sense of calibrated accuracy will read correct PO2 in air and read a correct elevated PO2 with a linear response to change of pressure. So what does that mean? That means in round numbers, if you've got 10 millivolts in air, then you should have roughly five times that in pure oxygen. Okay, so calculating expect, expected sensor millivolt output at elevated pressures. So what we're talking about is the linearity. You, if you know what your sensor is doing in air, then you should have an expectation of what you're going to get at elevated PO2s. So millivolts in air divided by its fraction of O2 of 0.21 yields the whole number of 100% or 1 of the PM millivolts. So for the sake of simplicity, let's assume the cell emit, emits 10 millivolts in air. 10 millivolts divided by 0 0.2102 equals 47.6 millivolts. So what we're doing is taking the millivolts in air and dividing it by the percentage of oxygen to get a linear number for 100%. So what we're talking about is millivolt in air cell will read 47.6 millivolts in pure oxygen at one atmosphere. That's an ideal and perfect situation. You probably will not get it that exact. It's not. It doesn't usually work that way. Uh, also, as an aside, when O2 analyzers weren't readily available, we were able to use a voltmeter uh, set to millivolts and then do this same math to analyze nitrox mixes. You didn't have to have an analyzer, you could do it with a uh, voltmeter. By comparing the perfect mathematically calculated linearity against the actual millivolt output of 100% of one atmosphere, we can determine linear deviation. So, in other words, ideally you should have 47.6 millivolts. You may not. You may have a little bit over or a little bit under that. Once we have a whole number, then we can multiply to predict millivolts at higher PO2s than 1.0. So, for example, again, for the sake of simplicity, if you took that 47.6 and multiplied it by 1.5, well, then that would tell you what millivolts should be at 1.5 PO2. So sensor reading, a sensor reading 10 millivolts in air, if you look at this chart, okay, you'll see that the numbers in the expected column are linear. Okay, they're all you know, uniform multiples of each other. Okay. If the millivolts in air were eight, the chart would read differently because the base multiplier of millivolts is different. 
So here's that same chart for eight millivolts, and you can see how it, it, it changes radically. So, for example, if you had three good sensors out of the box, and one read nine millivolts, the other one read, let's say, 9.8 millivolts, and the third one read 10.8, well, then you would have a, a, a huge variance in the millivolts from each of these sensors. So for that reason, you know, it's important that you become familiar with, with your, your millivolts and, and what they give you in air and in O2. Okay, so what we're looking for is how far they deviate from this ideal linear column. So linear deviation. And this is Bobby Franklin's mm -hmm. peeve, shall I say. Uh, he thinks, that, and rightfully so, he believes this is a very, very important concept. Okay. So if your cell reads 10 millivolts in air, but it's giving 43 millivolts in pure O2, okay, or PPO2 of 1.0, it's got linear deviation. If you remember before, we said that it should be giving you 47.6. So 10 millivolts divided by 0.21 equals 47.6 millivolts, but our cell is only reading 43. So what's that telling us? And what it's telling us is that it's going to overshoot because when it reaches 43, it's still looking for 47. So, is this a problem? Uh, yeah. Uh, how do we assign a value to linear deviation? Is it safe to dive that cell? Sensors operating outside their design specification can be unreliable and inaccurate. Problem is that there's no such thing as a perfect cell, so you have to understand what you're looking at and, and what you're reading. So, to calculate linear deviation, okay, you take your actual millivolts, what the thing is giving you at, at ambient pressure, 1.0 atmospheres, and you divide it by your expected millivolts, which in this case was 47.6. So a rule of thumb is always divide the small number by the larger number to get the percentage. So your actual millivolts is 43, divided by 47.6, which is your expected, equals 90% of the expected value. So that's telling you you have a 10% linear deviation. So is a 10% linear deviation safe to dive? What percent of linear deviation would be acceptable for you? Okay. Remembering that no cell is perfect. You have to understand what these cells are telling you. So linear deviation on three sensors, okay? So sensor one shows the linear response of PPO2 is, is rising. Sensor two shows a linear deviation. And sensor three shows a limited cell. So one is your ideal you know, your, your blue line is your ideal cell. So, sensor two is a cell that has some linear deviation, but if you look and see, it doesn't really become serious until it gets up past 1.6. The sensor three is limited. Okay, so sensor three is a dangerous cell. If you're diving a, cell, a sensor with 10 millivolts in air and a set point of 1.0 PO2, 10% linear deviation, we now know the actual PO2 will be above the actual set point. Expected divided by actual equals your true PO2. So 47.6 is what you expect. And you're dividing it by 43, which is your actual, you get 1.1. So at 1.0, 1 
you're actually you would actually be at 1.1. Why? Because it reached 1.0 when the millivolts were 43. The computer doesn't know that, so it keeps firing until it reaches what it thinks is 1.0 because it's looking for the 47.6 millivolts. But the reality is. It's overshooting it, and you're going to be at a 1.1. So the question now becomes, how serious is that? If you're trying to dive 1.0 and you're at 1.1, that's probably not going to hurt you. On the other hand, if you're at the upper end, it might. So linearity and limited, limited checks at 20 20 feet 6 meters should show 1.6 PO2 and 76.2 millivolts. It's factored of 47.6 divided at times 1.6 equals 76.2. Okay. So where is that going to take us? Okay. With a 10% linear deviation at 1.6, the actual output would be 68.5 millivolts. 76.2 millivolts times 0.9, or your 10% linear deviation, equals 68.5. So what's going to happen is that he's going to be shooting for that 76.2. So that means with a 10% linear deviation, your actual PPO2 would be 1.77. Now we're talking a potential 1.8 as opposed to, you know, 1.0 versus 1.1. So actual 68.8 millivolts divided by 1.6 equals 43 millivolts. Expected millivolts at 76.2 divided by 43 millivolts actually equals 1.77 PO2. Expected over actual equals true PPO2. So the rhetorical question. Is 10% linear deviation an acceptable number for your diving? This is something only you can answer. Uh, my own personal opinion is when cells start to become uh, unpredictable or when they start to show uh, linear deviations beyond uh, something that's acceptable, I get rid of them not worth gambling your life because you're too cheap to change yourself. Sense of failure modes. Okay. You know, the, the most famous one that we hear about all the time is current limited. Okay. So limited output, current limited, so millivolts stop rising behind, beyond the set set point. So why is this so dangerous? Because if your cell is limited to 1.2, and your controller is set to 1.3, it's just going to keep firing. It's never going to reach the 1.3, and you could be at 2.5 and not know it. Current spikes, okay, the sensor calibrates, but it has current spikes during the dive and voted out to too high a millivolt. Now, this is counterintuitive, but it does happen. Sometimes you'll you all of a sudden, you'll look and see the sensor is being voted out, and you say, why? And you look at the millivolts, you know, or even the PO2 that it's showing, and it's way above everything else. Fails the linearity test. Okay. Has an unacceptable linear, linear deviation. Okay. Um, if your cell's not linear, it's not good. Uh, if it's got, you know, 20% linear deviation, you probably want to get rid of it. Um, output is erratic. Uh, sometimes you'll have a cell that calibrates perfectly. You begin your dive. It works fine. And then halfway through, it just starts acting erratically. Uh, so it could also be an internal defect. Sometimes that happens. You get a bad batch out, right out of the factory. So this is why you try and get these cells from different batches. All your cells have production dates on them. So what I try to do is buy my cells at different times 
uh, typically every three or four months and try and get them at a different batch. Sometimes it's unavoidable. You need three cells and they're all out of the same batch. And then what I do is I use those three cells and then as time goes on, after four months, I pull a perfectly good cell out and I replace it with one from a different batch. And I do the same thing in another four months. I know it's wasteful, but you know, uh, if there's a manufacturing defect, you're going to more or less insulate yourself from it because you're not going to have to sell it with the same problem. Uh, another failure mode is oxidation or corrosion on the connector pin, especially with molex. Um, you should inspect it, and before you uh, install a cell, you should look at the molex, and you should look at the pins on the cell and make sure that they, just because it's true, it doesn't mean it can't be, you know, damaged or bent or anything else. Uh, sometimes, you know, you should periodically clean those contacts with the oxid or a similar non-toxic product. Be careful what you use. Don't just go buy any old electronic cleaner because some of them are could be toxic and you might wind up poisoning yourself. <clears throat> Sensors and current limiting. Okay, current limiting is the inability of the oxygen sensor to increase current in response to an increase in CO2. The consequence of this is that the millivolt output does not reflect the true CO2. In simple terms, the sensor is unable to deliver a voltage beyond a certain limit. So again, like I said before, if you're trying to reach 1.3 and the cell is limited to 1.2, it's never going to get there, and it's just going to keep firing the solenoid. Errors will occur if the calibration gas, gas pressure is higher than ambient pressure. So if you're calibrating with oxygen uh, or in any closed loop, you have to be careful that you're not adding the back pressure to it. Uh, back pressures will skew your calibration results. So if you fill your counter lungs and pressurize them, you'll wind up with an inaccurate calibration. This is very important. Uh, to make the point one time, I overpressurized with my breath uh, from over the shoulder counter lungs and I, at, at ambient pressure with the pure oxygen, I reached like, I don't know, 1.2 or 1.3. Uh, so that, just to make the point, you need to be careful that you, you're actually reading the, the uh, O2 and not reading pressure. Sensors that incapable of reading within our desired range of CPO2 can be deadly. Uh, a limited sensor combined with a higher set point can cause an unaware diver to operate above the safe range of CPO2, resulting in a hyperoxic condition. So this could lead to a convulsion. So they cannot function within a desired range of 0.21 to 1.6 at its minimum it should be replaced. So if you if the cell can't function within that range, uh, you need to get rid of it. And my own personal opinion is it should be able to function higher than 1.6. During the dive, the PPO2 should be manually spiked to confirm cells can read beyond their desired level and the millivolts are correct for the PPO2 shown. Do this at the beginning and end of each dive. So you may wonder why at the end. Well, sometimes after being used for an hour or two or three, the nature of the cell changes and you may find that you're getting different readings, different results than you, than you are at the beginning of the dive. The other thing to remember is that Millivolts are millivolts. So no matter where you get them or how you get them, they need to correspond to what you what your PPO2 is. Okay, another thing is you can always do a genuine flush and that'll confirm your cells. And a right click on the shear water will tell you what your build PO2 should be at whatever depth you're at, so you don't need to do any kind of math. 
um, that is provided you didn't lie to the shear water. You know, oftentimes people lie to the shear water thinking that they're going to defeat uh, the quote-unquote helium penalty. Well, the reality is that what you're really doing is killing one of the biggest safety features in the unit. Uh, I should say in the shear water. Uh, because the ability to right-click and know what your PO2 is uh, is a very nice feature. So now we're going to talk about voting logic. Okay, so what is it? How does it work? Why is it important? And how can we determine if cells voted out by voting logic are, in fact, the bad cells? Because oftentimes what you see is not what you really get. So rebreather manufacturers always use odd numbers of sensors. And the reason they do that is that way they can never be a tied vote. Okay. For example, if you have four cells and two of them say one thing and two of them say the other, well, which is correct? Systems are designed to compare data from each sensor to the other sensors. So sensor one is looking at sensor two and three and vice versa. If any one of the sensors deviates more than a specified percentage from the others, it's going to be <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, once you vote it out, it's ignored. So it's conceivable that the data from good sensors can be used to maintain a set point, but it's also those good sensors could, in fact, be the bad sensors. It's possible for two bad sensors to agree and vote a lesser number of good sensors, usually two out of three. The computer only uses data from sensors that agree with each other. This does not ensure that the data is accurate. This is why knowing your notebooks is so important. It's not unheard of for two sensors to fail in the same way at the same time. This is especially true if they're from the same batch number. Again, like you said earlier, try to select your sensors from different batches when purchasing. Only by thoroughly understanding sensors, limiting deviation and limiting, can you mitigate any of these risks. Voting logic. Again, risk mitigation. Determine linearity by observing the millivolt display and ambient pressure and see if it deviates from the expected millivolts. On the surface, flood the loop with the known gas. The millivolt display must be appropriate for the PPO2 shown. An alternative method is performing a video and flush at depth to verify the correct millivolts for the depth and FO2. A right click on the shear water will tell you the PPO2 at depth for the gas program. Again, assuming you didn't lie to it. Always believe the math over the control display. The math never lies. Preparing new sensors for operation. Oxygen sensors do not come from the manufacturer stored in bags filled with an inner gas or a vacuum. They come in bags that are sealed at the factory with regular air in them. Uh, the, they come in bags that, once sealed, allow the oxygen in the bag to be depleted by the sensor, slowly reducing the sensor's output until all the oxygen is exhausted. If an oxygen sensor is starved of oxygen too long, it will stop providing an output as the chemical reaction is inhibited. So again, it's a chemical reaction, and that's why your sensors will last so long in an oxygen analyzer and much shorter in a rebreather because they're not constantly exposed to the outrageously high PPO2s that are in a rebreather. When the sensor is removed from the bag, allow some time for it to activate and begin responding to oxygen. Sometimes you may hear that referred to as letting the sensor wake up. Uh, inspect the sensor connector pins before you install it. Look at the membrane. Make sure that the, the membrane is intact. Make sure the pins aren't uh, bent. Make sure that the plating on the pins is good, that there's no tarnishing on it. Okay, 
to slow it into the rebreather and prepare for calibration. So safe sensor rules for diving a CCR, okay? Just remember, when in doubt, change it out. Change sensors every 12 months, 52 weeks, for the 365 days. That's a quote stolen from Kevin Jurgensen. okay? Um, he's probably been diving rebreathers since the beginning of time. Uh, if possible, get your sensors from six different... Excuse me? If possible, get your sensors from different batches. One way to accomplish this is to change one sensor every four months or so. That way you'll always have fresh cells from different manufacturing batches. Do not mix different brands of cells. They have different response times. As you may recall, we said earlier, the response time is critical because it, it dictates when the solenoid is going to fire, if it takes too long, if it's got a longer response time than it's supposed to have, you're going to overshoot your set point. Do not use sensors that have been stored for over a year. Only use a sensor that is designed for, tested, and approved for use with your rebreather by the manufacturer. Do not store sensors in anti bags. Do not store sensors at high PPO2s for extended periods. All you're doing is eating up the fuel in them. Do not store sensors at high temperatures or in dry gas. Do not store sensors in an inert gas. Allow the rebreather's temperature to stabilize before calibrating. So in other words, you don't want to pull a sensor out of a very cold environment, throw it in a rebreather and calibrate it. Replace sensors that have been flooded. Just because it's got a hydrophobic membrane doesn't mean that the other end is waterproof. Never swap a sensor to another position in the electronics without calibration. Use, only use sensors that have been designed by you. These have hydrophobic membranes and can be used in a moist environment. So uh, you may have a sensor. Uh, I bet that, you you're not going to know the difference. You may have a sensor that appears to be identical to the one you need, but that's not the case always. It's got to have that hydrophobic membrane. If you use one without it, it'll work fine for about ten minutes, and then all of a sudden you'll start getting bizarre, uh, bizarre readings. So you never want to do that. Extended range CCR diving, okay. So the whole dynamic changes when you start doing longer and deeper CCR dives, okay. They require more skills and different procedures. I'm not going to get into the procedures and skills here, but the fact is, is that there is a thing called humidity limiting, and it's what I mentioned earlier. You get water droplets on the face of the sensor. It diminishes that area. So the sensor response is going to be changed, okay? So humidity limiting and a greater degree of linear deviation can occur during longer or deeper dives. Okay. Usually the temperature is, is on a deeper and longer dive. Usually the temperature gets hotter and the, the moisture content increases. <clears throat> Verifying cell integrity during a deep or long decompression is very important. So, you know, especially on your deeper, you know, your deeper deco stops, check those millivolts because you don't know, you know, that the if if there's an error, you're not going to see it necessarily. And if you've done, you know, a four or five hour dive and you've got, you know, a, a stop at 100 feet. Well, you need to check the millivolts and make sure that they correspond with, uh, you know, what you're looking for as far as the millivolt, you know, the millivolts for the PO2 you're diving. Perform a complete DU and flush with known PPO2 gas. Again, that's why it's not a good idea to lie to your shear water uh, at an appropriate depth to verify if there's any sun humidity limiting or an increase in linear deviation. 
And that flush will tell you. So, in summation, to determine the percentage of linear deviation, always divide the smaller millivolt number by the larger millivolt number. To determine your true PPO2, which accounts for any linear deviation, divide the expected millivolt value by the actual millivolt value. So, in other words, what you calculated divided by what you're, what you're actually seeing. For longer deep dives, be aware that humidity limiting and changes in previously calculated linear deviation can occur. A millivolt check after a diluent flush with a known gas will mitigate this risk. Never assume that because a sensor is linear, it will stay that way throughout the dive. Periodic sensor checks during your dive will keep you safe and alive. So one little trick you can use is put a little piece of tape the side or back of your handset. And in it, or on it, I should say, put a column S1, S2, S3, and then just jot down millivolts in air, millivolts at 1.0, millivolts at 1.6, or perhaps at your desired set point. And that way, periodically during the dive, if you, if you have any doubts, you look at the millivolts, look at your PO2, and look at that tape. That's going to tell you what you have. Over time, you'll develop a feel for your sensors, and they almost have like their own little personalities. And you probably won't need that tape, but in, in as you evolve, especially if you're you know if you're a newer rebreather ever, it doesn't hurt. You know, knowledge is power. The more you know about it, the more you understand about it, the safer you're going to be, the better off you're going to be. Uh, anyway, uh, we're at the end, and I wanted to thank Marty Watson and Joe St. Arm and uh, Bobby Franklin for the use of his research. And our reference materials were Kevin, Kevin Gore, ATI, and ISC.